Imagine that you are on a night out and you bump into a beautiful person and because you're highly attractive yourself, well, obviously, you get talking and exchanging phone numbers. Now, before mobile phones and their instant uh, storage facility, you'd have to memorize the number before writing it down. To do so, you uh, most people rapidly repeat the numbers over and over again. This technique is a classic example of using your short-term memory, the memory for very recent things. Now, psychologists usually distinguish it from long-term memory. Now, in this video, I will discuss the evidence that short-term and long-term memory are separate entities by describing the multi-store model of memory. We will also look at how short-term memory may operate and be used in terms of your working memory which we relate to executive function and the ability to make important even executive decisions. Don't worry, I will explain all these terms in this video to help you remember them in short term and in the future. Now, uh, many psychologists in the early part of the 20th century believed that only one type of memory existed existed. They thought that memory was linked to learning and after association, that is links between different ideas in the brain, were learned, uh, they formed a permanent part of memory. The only differentiation these psychologists made was that at the beginning of learning, memory traces were weaker than later in learning. One American philosopher and psychologist, however, believed in two types of memory. William James proposed the following distinction. You'd, according to him, you have primary memory, which is the contents of your consciousness or what you are thinking about right now. If I am to ask you to imagine the most beautiful person in the world, primary memory contains the image of that person. And then you have secondary memory, which uh, stores all your knowledges or knowledge most of which you aren't currently thinking about, such as what all other person or other people in the world look like. Now, William James' distinction between two types of memory was largely ignored until American psychologists Richard Atkinson and Richard Schifrin visited it. They created uh, the multi-store model of memory, which we will discuss in this section. In particular, how it helps to shed this uh, uh, shed light to short term short term memory. Now, the logic behind the multi store uh, model is that uh, the brain rapidly encodes the all the information that uh, bombards your senses. Now, the environmental input uh, that is into uh, what's called a sensory register. Uh, now, a sensory, a sensory register existed or exists for each of the five senses. You have iconic memory for sight, echoic memory for sound, haptic memory for touch, olfactory memory for smell, and gustatory memory for taste. Now, the sensory register contains all instant copies of the environmental output or input. They last for a short amount of time that is less than a couple of seconds, although different senses have different duration. Now, the capacity of these registers are largely unlimited. They take an incredible, uh, incredibly accurate snapshot of the environment for a very brief period of time, but their contents aren't available to your consciousness. Now, when you attend to something in the environment, it's transferred from the sensory register to the short-term memory store. This attention filters out uh, unwanted information from the environment and focuses on the relevant things that are worth processing. Now, the multi-store model developed from research concerning um, what is called as the primacy and uh, recency effects. Now, um, 
when you say prim primacy effects, it's when participants are presented with lists of things to remember uh, and they tend to remember all the items at the beginning of the list. Uh, a recency effect, however, is when participants also tend to remember all the items at the end of the list. Uh, in the simplest term, uh, the primacy effect refers to the tendency, our tendency as human beings, to recall information presented at the start of, the, of a list better than information at the middle of the list. In contrast to the primary, uh, primacy effect, the recency effect refers to our tendency to more easily recall items that are presented last in the list. In the case of the recency effect, it's likely due to those items being the most recent and therefore still being held in your short-term memory. Now, when you consider the primacy and recency effect in tandem, what you see is a U-shaped curve, also known as the serial position curve for uh, the recall of items in the list. Psychologists think that this tendency is because items at the end of the list are still in short-term memory and so easily uh, uh, easier to recall. And items at the beginning of the lists of the list have been transferred to the long-term memory. But items in the middle of the list haven't been transferred into the long term and don't remain in short-term memory, so they are actually forgotten. So uh, you can actually distinguish short-term memory from the sensory stores easily because it's available to your consciousness. Whatever you're thinking uh, about right now is in your short-term memory. And I hope it's the two words that, uh, it's the words of the last two sentences I have just mentioned. Otherwise, you are actually daydreaming. Now, the short-term memory is an ever-changing and updating stream of information, which means that it has a number of key characteristics regarding its capacity and duration. Now, short-term memory is the active part of memory and has a limited capacity. You cannot store much information in your short-term memory at one time. This uh, fact is actually obvious. How many uh, things can you think about simultaneously? One or two? To answer this question, we turn to one of the founding fathers of cognitive psychology. That is George Miller. In 1956, he published one of the most influential research papers of all time. In an experiment you uh, can try out uh, on your friends, he presented word lists of different lengths to his uh, participants and simply asked them to recall the words immediately after the last word was uh, presented. He found that virtually all his participants were able to recall between five and nine items, leading him to conclude that the capacity of short-term memory was the magic number seven plus or minus two. Now, uh, Miller's experiments were quite easy and helped his participants remember. As a result, the magic number seven may be an overestimation. Research also show that when presented with long words, uh, long word lists, participants tend to recall only the last four items in the list, in addition to uh, the first four items that first four items that is. The more recent items in the list seems to replace the early earlier ones in short-term memory. In other words, items are displaced from short-term memory. Along with more recent evidence, these results suggest that the actual capacity of short-term memory is around four items. So what do we mean by an item? You may think of an item as a single digit or even a single word, but uh, is that actually true? Uh, to understand that, try remembering this list and then after 30 seconds, write down as many letters as you possibly can.
Alright, time's up. Now, if Miller's magic number of 7 plus or minus 2 is correct, you probably remember that many items. Now, try again, but uh, this time using this list. Now, chances are that this time you remember the entire list. The, the improvement is because we chunk the items in meaningful groups. If you are to look at it, we actually looked into the same letters and uh, number combination. GMA, NASA, TV5, PAP, LBC, uh, uh, STM, LOL, and PHL. But what we did is to cluster the words uh, into meaningful groups like GMA, and then NASA, then TV5, then PAP, then LBC, then STM for short-term memory, then LOL, and then PHL for the Philippines. Now, therefore, your STM's capacity can be counted in the number of chunks rather than the number of individual items. Another critical aspects, aspect is the duration of STM. How long, or short-term memory, how long can you keep items in your head? When a person you fancy gives you her number or his number, how long before you start to forget the digits? Psychologists have tested this issue using word lists. Yes, yet again, word lists. Now, researchers present a series of words and ask participants to recall them, either immediately after they're presented or after various delays. Participants recall is better immediately. After 18 to 30 seconds, their memories for the words have all but disappeared. Suggesting this, uh, it, uh, suggesting this as the duration of short-term memory. Information in its uh, and it decays after about 30 seconds. However, you can enhance the duration of memory with rehearsal. This is by repeating the items in your head over and over again. So you engage in what we call as maintenance rehearsal, which allows the information to be held in your short-term memory for longer. Now, this tendency also relates to what we call as the primacy and recent re recency effect that we have discussed earlier unless you've already forgotten that. Now, most cognitive psychologists believe that your short-term memory is much more than just a simple short-term store of information. They think that it's working, or rather doing something. Alan Baddeley and Graham Hitch, two British cognitive psychologists, de derived one of the most widely accepted short term uh, model, uh, short-term memory model, the working memory model. Now, uh, the working memory model contains an attention controlling uh, central executive and three storage components, phonological loop, visual spatial sketchpad, and episodic buffer. Now, in this section of the video, I will describe each of these components, including how it may operate and evidences that it exists, and how psychologists can measure uh, a person's amount of working memory. But before I go into uh, the specific uh, modules of this, uh, the specific parts of this theory, uh, uh, let, let, let us discuss how uh, uh, how each of them are being measured. Now, psychologists have devised a lot of tasks to measure working memory and its different components, usually involving presenting participants with uh, lists of words and testing their memory for them. Now, this approach, however, has the limitations of only being able to test verbal memory. Therefore, they devised many more tasks. 
For example, to measure the phonological loop, the digit span task involves participants hearing a sequence of numbers and being asked to recall them. The number of digits presented increased until the participants failed at this task. On the other hand, to measure the visual spatial sketchpad, the Corsi block design task involves participants being presented with a series of colored or patterned blocks in a particular order. They are then asked to remember the order in which the blocks were presented. And to measure the episodic buffer, researchers usually make a different visual search tasks involving binding together the stimuli to be found with single or multiple features. To measure the central executive in the operation span test, uh, test participants have to remember a series of between 2 and 8 presented words or letters. The participants are then given a mathematical puzzle to complete. Therefore, they have to complete two tasks at the same time. Their recall for the words or letter is then calculated. So, the phonological loop is often described as the mind's ear. Uh, it's how people are able to store and process sounds. Think of it as your inner voice, the, the voice that actually sounds good when you sing in the shower. <laughs> now, the phonological loop comprises, uh, comprises two components. A phonological store, which is a very limited capacity uh, store for sound, usually associated with language and an articulatory rehearsal mechanism, a process where uh, you verbally but silently repeat words that you've heard. Now, information stored in the phonological loop can only be held for a few seconds before decaying or fading away. Stored information can be displaced by new information as well. Therefore, the amount of information you can hold in your short-term memory is limited. Now, there are two main sources of evidence back up, uh, backing up that the phonological loop exists. These are uh, what, re we, what we refer to as the phonological similarity effect. I understand that it's a bit mouth mouthful to say that uh, term, but in essence, it means that participants remember lists of words that sound the same, for example, man, cat, cap, map, can, far less accurately than words of different, uh, that were the lists of words that sound differently. For example, pit, day, cow, pen, and sock. Now, this effect occurs whether the words are presented visually or verbally, suggesting that words must be sub-vocalized or repeated silently in your head to gain access to memory. You have to say the words under your breath in order to store them. If you are asked to engage in articulatory suppression, for example, counting backwards at the same time, the phonological similarity effect disappears for visually presented words. This results suggest that verbally presented words have direct access to the phonological store, but you have to say visually presented words aloud to gain access to the phonological store. Another evidence is that of the word length effect, where participants remember list of words short, uh, list of short words much more accurately than list of long words, uh, even if the number of words in the list are the same, because the latter are too long and take up too much time for the phonological loop's capacity. Now, long-term memory and stored knowledge strongly influ influence the phonological loop. People can remember more words than, non uh, than non-words or words in another language when presented with list uh, to remember. Uh, also, familiar words, familiar sounds seem to be stored more easily in the phonological loop and so it must be connected to the long-term memory. Now, the phonological loop is crucial for learning new languages as a child or a second language learner. 
in your native language, you have sufficient experience with the speech sound and words so that storing the words being said to you requires little effort. When learning new languages, however, you aren't familiar with the words and sounds and therefore you need to store more sounds in your phonological loop. The articulatory rehearsal system means that when you hear a new word, you try to say it under your breath. This rehearsal allows the word to be transferred to your long-term memory. Now, some evidence suggests that the phonological store is located in part in the part of the brain called the left inferior parietal cortex, which is just behind the left ear. Uh, now, the left inferior uh, frontal cortex, which is in front of your left ear has been identified as the region associated with articulatory rehearsal. Now the visual spatial sketch pad is basically the same as the phonological loop but for visually presented stimuli. The made-up term for this component combines two real words, visual and spatial, because it acts as a store and processing unit for visual images and spatial information, but deals with their memory separately. For example, or for rather for spatial memory, it involves understanding where something is in the world. For example, being able to remember where the items are in your bedroom. Such spatial information can be provided visually or from other senses, including touch and sound. Um, making this component of working memory what we call as multimodal, potentially involving many senses. Visual memory, on the other hand, is having an image of something, such as the face of someone you know. Now, the visual spatial sketchpad includes imagination. This is when you imagine your best friend's face, the image is brought to your visual spatial sketchpad. Now, the visual and spatial distinction is supported by the fact that the brain uh, processes spatial information differently to image-only information. Combining the visual information means that you can remember sequences of action to learn motor skills. For example, learning a computer game such as Super Mario Brothers <laughs> involves learning to click on the correct buttons in a particular sequence. You have to hold the spatial locations where the Koopa Troopa is positioned relative to Mario the temporal sequence when the Koopa Troopa turns around ready for Mario to jump on his head and the image or the entire platform in your working memory at the same time. It's actually an amazingly complex process that we take for granted. Now, evidence for the visual spatial sketchpad stems from data suggesting that Completing uh, two visual tasks at the same time is very difficult. For example, if participants have simply uh, to watch a ball move around a screen, they perform much less accurately when they're asked to imagine a route around a university at the same time than when they're asked to remember words at the same time instead. Considerable evidence suggests that the visual spatial sketchpad is separable uh, from the phonological loop. Articulatory suppression has a much smaller effect on visual task than verbal task. Also, some patients have an intact phonological loop as measured by the digit span task, but an impaired visual spatial sketchpad as measured by the Corsi block design task. Now, two components of the visual spatial sketchpad parallel to uh, the phonological loop of the proceeding section are actually at play. You have the visual cache, uh, a passive store of information like a screen that captures the information you're thinking about. When you're mentally uh, imagining something, the image stored is in the visual cache like an artist's canvas. So, you also have the inner scribe, 
the active part of the uh, visual spatial sketchpad in which you plan movements. It's primarily involved in the storage of spatial information and the sequence of actions. Now, the inner scribe is easily disrupted by spatial uh, movement and is the process by which images are drawn onto the visual case. Think of it uh, like being a painter. The episodic buffer links the working memory with the long-term memory in, and is how information from memory in any sense is brought to conscious awareness. It's also a temporary store of information from long-term memory so that it can be used. Um, the episodic buffer links information to the other components of working memory so that they can process information more reliably as indicated by uh, the, the arrows going to and fro uh, episodic buffer from both visual spatial sketchpad and phonological loop. So, um, Linking uh, long-term memory knowledge of language to the phonological loop allows you to interpret what people are, are saying much quicker than without this link. Now, the episodic buffer integrates or binds information into discrete episodes. The binding process is largely automatic and does not require a great deal of central executive processing. Don't worry about that. We will be talking about that later on. Uh, and it comes in two forms. Um, you have static binding, uh, which links two sensory elements that tend to occur together, such as orange-orange. That is the color orange and the fruit orange. Seeing the two features together frequently means that they become bound together as one concept. And then you have dynamic binding, which is much more attentionally demanding than static binding. It involves combining rather arbitrary features and can be basic, uh, the basis rather of, info, uh, of imagination. Therefore, dynamic binding can be anything you want. Even a pink orange with blue polka dots flying through a green sky with a purple sun. You probably get the idea. Now, given that the episodic buffer links all the other components of working memory, it processes all different senses, that is modality. It also has a limited storage capacity and can combine or bind across senses as well as with other, uh, within senses. So, uh, and uh, they all, uh, it also binds new information to information stored in the long-term memory. Lastly, we have the, execut uh, the central executive, and it's the central processor of working memory. It's the control unit that guides each of the other parts of working memory and is often considered the driving force for attention. It's like a computer central processor, and because of that, it has a limited capacity. It can devote uh, resources to each of the subcomponents of, of working memory, but only if it has spare resources. Its name, the central executive, reveals its fundamental importance. Its functions are often uh, called executive functions. So the, uh, the central executive is assumed to have three core functions. Number one, to focus attention on a particular task. Uh, the central executive ensures that complex tasks are focused on and distractors are ignored, such as watching a fascinating video on cognitive psychology and ignoring magandang buhay on the television. Your central executive puts its effort into watching while blocking out other aspects of the environment. To switch attention between uh, different tasks is another, uh, is another function of, of the central executive. Sometimes you need to switch quickly between tasks uh, such as cooking and when a child comes uh, running in crying because he's been hurt. 
your central executive keeps an eye on the information that has been blocked out, waiting for something that requires attention to be focused on it. Now, to divide attention is uh, the third um, uh, function of, this of, of the central executive. Now, sometimes you just have to do two things simultaneously, such as, say, watching TV while doing your homework. Now, your central executive calculates how much of its resources can be allocated to one task and how much can be on another task. So, one way to explore the, exec uh, the central executive is to use dual task procedures in which participants have to complete one task while being distracted with another task. If researchers can find a task that selectively disrupts one component of working memory but not others, they can find evidence for the existence of separable components. In one experiment, psychologists measured people's performance while they uh, the participants, uh, not the researchers, that is, played a game of chess during three different secondary tasks. Articulatory suppression, that is affecting the phonological loop, and finger tapping, affecting the visual-spatial sketchpad. Now, it didn't uh, greatly affect chess, but trying to think of random numbers did because it's an executive process like playing chess. Evidence firmly places the central executive's activity in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. This is located near the base of the frontal part of the brain just to the side of each of your eyes. Now, short-term uh, working memory is crucial. Uh, the ability to control your attention, to focus on relevant things, engage in conversation with friends, drive, play basketball, study, and so on depends on working memory. Its involvement in conversations shows that even social psychology depends on it. You need to be able to focus on the right person to speak, remember information relevant to the conversation, vocalize it, and discuss it, while inhibiting irrelevant information. Clearly, working memory is vital which suggests that everyone has the ability. But in fact, people have significant individual differences in their working memory's capacity and ability. Psychologists use various tests to calculate a working memory span, a measure of how much working memory someone has. It correlates strongly with intelligence. An example of the type of task that correlates with working memory span is the anti-saccade task. In it, <clears throat> something appears on a screen. Participants are instructed first to look at it and then second to look at the opposite side of the screen. People instinctively look at the object that appears stopping or what we call as inhibiting yourself looking at this object is quite difficult and participants with higher working memory capacity are better able to perform this second condition than those with lower working memory capacity the working memory span changes with age working memory develops slowly through childhood reaching a plateau during the mid-20s and declines in later adulthood. Importantly, working memory spans predict the ability to comprehend test texts and therefore children's educational performance even if the working memory test is done five years before the final exams. It also correlates with reasoning tasks and even uh, predicts performance by U.S. Air Force pilots. Now, working memory may be vitally important, but what does the working memory span actually measure? One suggestion is that it's based on the processing speed and the capacity of the neurons in the brains associated with working memory. Research show that people with higher working memory spans seems to show smaller brain response during complex tasks, 
suggesting that their neurons are more efficient than those with lower working, lower working memory spans. In the working memory model, the central executive is thought to control three executive tasks. Other executive abilities may also be related to working memory, but the evidence is actually mixed. So, uh, in this part of the video, we review the entire array of executive processes and relate them to the most highly evolved part of the brain, the frontal lobes. So, the uh, executive attention imp uh, involves uh, focusing attention on a particular task or multiple tasks at hand. It also is vital for resolving conflicts, and I don't mean fights between worrying children. Conflict resolution in this case is when two potential competing responses exist for a particular, particular task. One of your executive processes concerns deciding which of the potential competing responses need to be undertaken. Imagine uh, for some reason that you don't take the normal route to college or work. Your attentional system has to override the automatic route to your uh, destination and allow you to go where you need to go. The doctor perhaps or, or, or to the market or wherever you want to go. So, to accomplish this aim, the executive system requires two processes. A conflict monitor to identify a conflict between your goal and an automatic process. It's located in the anterior uh, cingulate, which is part of the which is the part of the brain at the front, but about an inch or so from the skull. And you also need an attention controller to direct the attentional resources to the relevant task features. It's located and it's located in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, cortex, which is part of the brain near the base of the frontal part of the brain, just to the side of each eye. Now, atten uh, executive attention is also vital for categorizing objects. It acts as a link between the perceptual system and the memory stores. Therefore. It's the part of the cognitive system responsible for consciousness. Switching attention from one important task to another is an important executive function. Cognitive psychologists use the switch task to measure, to measure task switching. Participants are presented with a simple task, such as uh, to press X when um, Add numbers appear in this on the screen and why when even numbers appear sometimes and less frequently the numbers are in red in this case the participants must respond with the opposite key to the ones they're practiced with in this case participants take longer to respond this switch cost is due to the fact that when participants engage in a task they develop a set of rules or strategies that they are applying. If the rules need to be changed suddenly, the participant's executive system needs to be engaged, which takes up time up, uh, uh, that is up to about half a second. Consider how the switch cost may affect pilots. They're engaged in a landing plane when suddenly an alarm goes off and they have to switch their attention from one demanding task to another and back again to ensure that they configure the plane appropriately. Taking an extra half second to react in such a case can be life-threatening. Now, inhibition is one of the most important executive functions. And not, uh, this is not refusing to reveal your legs at the beach, but the ability to ignore irrelevant information. Response inhibition in, a part uh, in, a par in particular is the ability to prevent an already prepared response from happening. The go slash no go test is a simple task to measure response inhibition. Participants are presented with lots of one letter, say X. 
and are told to respond whenever they see it. They're also told not to respond if they see the letter Y. Now, the test involves more X's than Y's, and participants make error in this task, often unintentionally responding to the Y. Now, a lack of inhibition has been implicated in a number of clinical disorders, including schizophrenia, attention deficit hyperactive disorder, and obsessive compulsive disorder. It's also involved in children's behaviors when they simply act without considering their actions. They uh, know the ability to inhibit uh, develops slowly and isn't fully developed until a person uh, reaches early 20s. Now, a great deal of debate revolves around whether inhibition is a single thing or whether many different types exist. Hundreds of different tasks can make inhibition or can measure inhibition. However, if, uh, however uh, they don't all correlate with each other, which suggests that existence of, or, or rather the existence of different types of inhibition. Um, currently, we acknowledge motor uh, inhibition or the inhibition of a prepared motor response. Uh, and you also have what is called oculo oculomotor inhibition which is the inhibition of eye movements and then you have cognitive interference which is inhibition as a result of competing cognitive sources of information and then you have sustained uh, attention which is inhibition due to fixing too much attention on one task response inhibition is a special kind of attentional focus and involves additional brain areas being involved, including the orbitofrontal cortex, which is just below the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Now, certain types of planning are an executive function and can be challenged and, and can be a challenge. For example, when you uh, cook a Sunday roast and have to ensure that the roast potatoes are ready at the same time as the beef joint, the, broco the broccoli, and the white rice. Now, cognitive psychologists call planning in this sense sequencing, and you can examine it by giving participants a sequence of letters to remember. You test uh, the participants on their, on their memory for the letter that comes after the one that they are presented with. Now, this task requires them to first remember the order of the presented letters and then find uh, uh, and then uh, remember what uh, action to take. So, participants find this task much more difficult than simply recognizing uh, whether a letter was in the list they have seen. Now, the way in which people's executive processes code uh, order is by binding or tagging order information to the item. In other words, when you are presented with a letter, you code the letter and the other, uh, the, the order in which it was presented. To ensure that you don't behave in an unusual way like everyone else, you have to monitor your behaviors and speech. Monitoring is more complex than the other executive functions. It involves being aware of yourself, your performance, and what the prefer performance should be like. Plus, it's happening at the same time as the to be monitored process is occurring. One test of monitoring is to give participants six objects. In the first trial, they point to one object. In the next trial, they must point to a different object. In the next trial, they point to a different one and so on. Now, this task requires remembering or monitoring what they have just done. Research shows that people with damage to their frontal lobe struggle at this task. Now, another source of monitoring is looking for one's own errors. Whenever you are completing a task, say writing your research manuscript, uh, you're likely to make small errors such as typographic or spelling mistakes. Now, the monitoring system consistently checks what you're doing and corrects the mistakes by stopping the current task 
and instigating a corrective measure, such as reaching for the delete or backspace button. Now, some interesting evidence suggests that the brain is aware of its mistakes as soon after making them. A unique response measured by uh, electroencephalography called error-related negativity occurs only 100 milliseconds, it's actually one-tenth of a second, after an error has been made, showing how quickly the brain detects errors. So, um, uh, in this video, we discuss the evidence, the evidence that short-term and long-term memory are separate entities by describing the multi-store model of memory. We also looked at how short-term memory may operate and be used in terms of your working memory, which we related to uh, executive functions and the ability to make important and even executive decisions. In the next video, we will talk about long-term memory. But till then, this has been Dex Kamitan, and thank you for watching.